after the shipwreck and pulling them onto the, out of the water onto the beach, everyone must have been so relieved to have solid ground under their feet. They didn't know where they were, and it was still raining, but they were safe. And the locals came quickly and built a fire to warm the survivors. Hospitality, especially to those in need, was a valued and an important quality in the ancient cultures. Um, that was partially because inns were few and very sketchy, and so you provided for people. And we see that demonstrated and appreciated in today's um, story. Paul was helping. Paul was helping. You know, he could have just been huddled by the fire. But no, he's getting wood and he is helping. When a snake that's hiding in the branch, branches, you know, jumped up and struck him. The Greeks, the Romans, and also the locals all had a goddess, justice of some sort. Paul is clearly one of the prisoners. And when the snake bit him, they assumed that the goddess Justice had brought retribution for his crimes, even though he had escaped death at sea. And they watched, and they waited, and nothing happened. I mean, Paul himself didn't even seem much bothered by the attack. And not only did he not die, but there's not even a reaction on his arm. So eventually, they decide that no, he is not an evil criminal. He must be a god. Unlike Lystra, however, there's no major show of offering sacrifices to him. That might have been because whoever he was, he was not their local god. So they could let these other things sort of move. Um, I have some pictures that I found about this event that I wanted to share with you. So this one um, is by Willie Appa, and it's the Shipwreck of Paul. He is a Maltese artist, and so he would have been intimately familiar with the imagery from Acts 27 and 28. Centuries worth of Maltese literature and art and cultural traditions um, have been devoted to Paul's arrival on their island and the widespread conversion of faith that resulted from that. Now, Luke doesn't tell us anything about Paul preaching in Malta. But when we look at the change that took place in the island, we know that had to be happening. This particular picture was designed for the 19th centenary of Paul's shipwreck. So um, every year they have an annual celebration of the shipwreck. And um, this one was for the 19th century one. Despite all the numbers of figures in the painting and the fact that the kneeling man occupies the true center of the composition, Paul nonetheless dominates. With a palette verging on monochromatic, Paul's resolute stance and white robes, which seem to glow in the light of the fire, mark him as the main protagonist in the narrative. Although the picture's tension weakens slightly on the far left side, where the darkened soldiers are inattentive. The inward moving force unifies the composition and brings the central action into focus. The snake isn't depicted mid-strike or dangling from the apostle's hand. Instead, Paul is caught in the act of flinging the viper back into the fire, the impact of the purposeful motion intensified by the movement of his robe. By choosing to paint this mid-air moment, we are invited to move past the familiarity of the theme and to contemplate instead the precise moment at which the action took place, the moment that heralded a radical transformation of the artist's own culture and the original viewers. This picture is a mural that's an ancient part of the chapel that is at Canterbury Cathedral in England. Here, the drama of the sequence is condensed into its core elements. Paul, the snake, which actually doesn't show up too much, but since this was actually painted somewhere around 18, I mean, 1180, it's doing pretty good. Um, 
So it's Paul, the serpent, and the fire. Gone are any signs of the shipwreck. Paul's, um, there are no Roman soldiers standing by huddled groups of sailors and prisoners. No kindly islanders who are um, gathering sticks to feed the fire. The artist has divorced, divorced Paul from the geographic and narrative context um, of his twofold delivery of death. He is stark against the bright blue background, bare feet upon a strip of green earth as he bends um, toward the flames. Paul's monumental figure fills the, compo fills the composition and commands the viewer's attention. We are effectively drawn into Acts 28.3, the moment the viper is driven out of the heat of the fire and fastens itself on Paul's hand. And yet Paul seems to be unperturbed by the attack. Despite not having any crowd of shocked onlookers to, foil, to provide foil for Paul's calm demeanor, the effect of his composure is still palpable. The leaping snake only serves to emphasize the natural tranquility the author achieves. Paul is flesh and blood, but he maintains his faith that God will deliver him as he has done previously, and that he will indeed stand trial before Caesar in Rome. Um, so these are on um, a website that I have down there, visual commentary of scripture and what I read was part of their commentary. Art obviously uses imagination to portray the scene, um, which like this one, the author actually has never seen. But both capture the calm faith that we have seen in Paul throughout this journey. He knew he was going to get to Rome. Jail in Caesarea, a wicked wild Mediterranean storm, and a viper None of those hurdles shake his faith on the promises of his God. It's such an inspiration for us there. Publius, who is the chief official of the island, also shows hospitality to the survivors. We don't know who all is included in the us that he welcomed into his home, but it could have been a large group. His father is sick, and so Paul goes in, lays hands on him, prays, and he is healed. Interestingly, this is the only time in Acts where laying on of hands and prayer um, are linked. And this combination emphasizes the fact that Paul is not healing by his own power, but by the power of his God. He is not a God, but he belongs to a powerful God. And that fact was probably noted by the locals who are still trying to figure out who he is. He is not a God, but he is a powerful God, and they bring their sick to be healed. They are grateful for the care that Paul and perhaps Luke provide, and so they provide the needed supplies and food when Paul, Julius, and the crew finally leave the island. That was important because they probably lost everything between the storm and the shipwreck. The bay which Paul's ship met its demise is now called St. Paul's Bay. It's about 10 miles away from the bay that the grain ships regularly used on their trips from Rome down to Egypt. And fortunately, or perhaps providentially, there is a grain ship that made it that far in the fall before deciding that it just was not safe enough to go the rest of the way to Rome. So Julius finds lodging for them. They wait out the winter, and then they go on that ship back to Rome. The first part of their journey in the fall was slow going because winds were against them. The second part was that crazy full-blown storm. This new grain ship is pushing the spring season boundary but they don't have too far to go, and the weather looks good. That's exactly what they said at Fairhaven. However, this time, they are right. And they, um, they make a very good time. So they arrive and disembark at Petunia, which Tricia says is right by Naples, if, 
for, for we who know modern Italy. Um, and Christians there invite them to stay a week. And it appears that the hospitality is offered to the whole group. So Julius, the soldiers, and the prisoners. And it would be a welcome rest before the final push on to Rome, which is about 130 miles from where they are. So while they are enjoying their time with these Christians, word travels to Rome of his impending arrival, and people come out to meet him. So the letter, which we call Romans, would have been written and delivered to them prior to this point, and they are excited that Paul is finally going to come visit them, even if he is in chains. The Apian Forum is about 43 miles from Rome. Three Taverns is about 33. So this shows a lot of respect for Paul to come that far. And seeing them, Paul praised God and took courage. Now, we have seen this word for courage before. Becky introduced us to tharseo. So, we'll say it all together. Tharseo. Um, and the fact that he needed tharseo implies that he was a little lacking of courage, of courage at this point. He had wanted to come to Rome for so long. And yet, actually being in Rome with so many questions about his reception, and about his future, could still have felt a little daunting. But God, through his people, lifted him up, and he was ready to glorify God in whatever came. So this excited group of Christians joined Paul and Luke and Aristarchus and Julius and the soldiers and the prisoners as they finished their journey and walk into Rome. This picture actually makes me kind of chuckle. This had to be the only time that taking prisoners into Rome actually felt like a party. Um, would have changed everything. Now, most of those prisoners are probably going to their deaths. But in my imagination, they probably have peace knowing that they have a future after their death because they just spent months and months with Paul. And you know what they heard over and over and over and over. Paul was not considered a high enough risk to need a centurion here, or even the standard two guards. But still, this is a legal issue, and so he is chained to one guard at all times. He's allowed to live in what we would call house arrest, um, in a rented house, and guests are free to come and go as they please. And he had hardly even settled in when he sent for the lo local Jewish leaders. Now, the synagogues in Rome were independent. There was no one head of the whole system there. Um, so this invitation would have involved having someone, probably a Jewish Christian, deliver the invitation to all of the different synagogues, because Paul can't leave his house. I was thinking, that would lead to some interesting conversations. So, we received this invitation from Paul. Do you, do you know who Paul is? No, nope. I've, I've never heard of Paul. But he's a Pharisee, and his letter is well written. Yeah, but it looks like he's a prisoner of Nero. Yeah, but he's not in the main prison area. Yeah, do you think it's safe to go visit him? Well, I'm really curious, so come on, come on, let's go. So, a little bit of background. In chapter 18, we met Aquila and Priscilla in Ephesus because Emperor Claudius had expelled the Jews from Rome. The Roman historian, Susnesis, something, um, explained that Claudius explained, expelled the Jews because they were rioting because of Emporius Christus. So that phrase could mean at the instigation of Christus which sounds a lot like Christos, which was the word for Messiah, the word they used for Jesus. So maybe there had been riots in Rome around the Messiah Jesus in the same way that we saw Thessalonica and Ephesus and other places. But that's the only comment we have, so we don't really know. Nero 
became emperor about six years before this, before this situation. And he reversed a bunch of the edicts that Claudius had done, including this one. So then the Jews started going back home. We don't know how many Jews were there at this point. Prior to that, they estimate, prior to the edict that sent them out, they estimate 40 to 50,000. So this is a big group. Um, but again, we aren't sure how many actually returned. But those who did are kind of edgy, and they don't want to draw attention to themselves again. And they don't trust the Roman leadership. So when they do come, Paul builds just lots of build, bridge building. He says, my brothers, our people, the customs of our ancestors. I was arrested in Jerusalem, which kind of downplays all the violence that actually happened in Jerusalem. But he does mention that the Jews objected to his release. But Jewish opposition is not a major focus of what he's talking about. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. And he ends with, it is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. This isn't a lot of show. Paul truly believes this. He is a good Jew. He just thought that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah and that the Gentiles have now been fully invited to the party. And I'm impressed with these Jewish leaders. They had heard nothing about Paul. That might be because a letter or a delegation from Jerusalem had not gotten to Rome yet. You remember that Julius was on ships that were trying to get to Rome as soon as possible. But it could also be that those in Jerusalem faced the fact that if they couldn't win on their own turf, they had no chance of winning in Rome. And so they just dropped the case. So those these leaders had heard nothing about Paul, they had heard a lot of negative reports about this Jesus sect. And here is an articulate, educated Jew who is part of that group. So they wanted to get together when they would actually have enough time to talk in depth and get a clearer view of what this controversy was about. I like that. So often, when we have gotten negative feedback about somebody or about a group, especially if there's been a lot of it, it is easy to assume the worst and then just move forward, to let that negativity color our view of those people. And they did come, and they came in even larger numbers, and it was a marathon. They are with Paul from morning until night. Paul witnessed to them, explained about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Paul witnessed, explained, tried to persuade. He is clearly pouring his whole heart into this. And some are convinced and believe. Some. And others would not believe. This is the pattern that we have consistently seen. But it's sort of fun because those on board start arguing with the ones that don't believe. And they're disagreeing among one, one another. So it's not just Paul speaking. So then Paul tucks in one parting shot, and it's a quote from Isaiah 6. The Holy Spirit spoke truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet. So this is really an indictment against the Jews of Isaiah's time, and yet Paul is implying that the unbelieving Jews in his time deserve the same rebuke. Go to these people and say, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceive. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. If I say... Mary had a little lamb. What would you say? Mary had a little? Um, if I had that same question to someone, say, 
in Tibet, they would look at me like I was truly odd because it would be completely out of context for them. This passage um, is quoted in part or in whole in all four of the Gospels, as well as here in Acts. And sometimes I have struggled with it because it feels like, especially in Isaiah, that these people have no choice. But this is not a fatalistic declaration that these people have no chance to believe. But it's the realization that they have become calloused, deaf, and blind. And the implication is, if they would change, God would heal that. But it's not the end of the quote. Just like you knew Lamb, the Jews in Jesus' time would have heard the whole quote in their mind, or in Paul's time, they're both quoted, um, a whole quote in their mind, even though, even though only the first part is spoken. So the rest of it is a little like this. After Isaiah had heard God speak this, his question is, how long, Lord? How long are the people going to be like this? And God's answer was to describe the exile, which is way past Isaiah's death, actually. It would take destruction to bring the heart of the nation back to God. But even then, they would be like the stump of an oak tree that is cut down. The tree would re-sprout. Even when it looked like the end, there would be life. God always has a faithful remnant. The faithful remnant theme has flowed through the whole Old Testament. And it is how the Jewish Christians came to understand this confusing, on their part, confusing rejection of Jesus by so many of their fellow Jews. They're excited. Look, look, the Messiah has come. But so many don't see. And it just broke their hearts. And the believing Jews realized that they are standing in the shoes of Isaiah. Like Isaiah, they are seeding the hard-heartedness of their own people. And like Isaiah, they kept sharing God's message, even though they knew many would reject. And the rejection might turn violent. But the love of God constrained them to continue. This is really convicting to me. Do we reach out to those who don't appear to be interested in Jesus at all? I mean, some of them we might even consider enemies. Well, that sounds harsh. So something not quite like enemies. But their views might be really opposed to ours and to God's about moral and social and political things. Do we reach out or do we write them off? Do we put up walls rather than tear them down? Do we just ignore those people? Or sometimes worse? We might be missing that hidden faithful remnant because we do not know the heart of others. Isaiah's full quote had both a harsh critique of the spiritual condition of his nation and also the warning of serious judgment. So does Paul's. And we'll talk more about that later. Then Paul goes on and he says, Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Notice the verb tense here. God's salvation has been sent. That's past tense. Paul is not telling them something he's going to be doing, but rather the actions that God has already begun. The Gentiles have already been invited in. Some people have used this section to say that God has rejected the Jews, and actually we shouldn't even share the gospel with them. It has been used at different times throughout history as a basis for some really ugly anti-Semitic words and actions. And that so completely misses what is being said here. 
Paul has sort of a similar comment that he makes in Pisidian Antioch. There, you can remember, the Jews saw the crowds and they were filled with jealousy. And they began to contradict what Paul was saying and heap abuse on him. And Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you truth, to you first. But since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, now we will turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord commanded us. I have made you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. But those words are applied to the happenings in one town. That is not a permanent turning away from Jewish outreach. And we know that because six verses later, they're back in the synagogue teaching again. Today's passage doesn't even mention turning away from the Jews. It only adds the Gentiles into the picture because the gospel is for everyone. It is for Jews and for Gentiles. For two whole years, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. For two whole years. Then, then what happened? Are you curious? Did he finally go to court? Was he totally free? Did he go to Spain? Was he executed? We're sort of just left like hanging. But it doesn't feel like we're hanging to Luke. Do you remember his thesis statement back in um, Acts 1.8? Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. From Luke's standpoint, his story has come to completion. The Spirit came, and the disciples were indeed filled with power. They were his witnesses, both in word and also in actions, because they knew the mission of the church was to look like Jesus, to share him individually and as a community. They were his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now in Rome, the center of their world, the point at which all things can go out to the ends of the earth as they know it. And everywhere they witnessed, there were some who came to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And everywhere there was also opposition. This was a pattern throughout the whole story of Acts, and it's a continuing story since the end of Acts. We are part of that story. There's pressure on Christians nowadays not to talk too much about Jesus and his kingdom because, you know, we might offend somebody. We might create opposition. So there's going to be opposition. But we are called to follow in the footsteps of Peter and Philip and Paul. And we must act and speak as true representatives of Jesus with love and with kindness and with courage. Acts isn't really going to be truly finished until the Lord returns. But now, for us, let us by the Spirit spread the light of Jesus across our paths until he comes or we go join him. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for this book of Acts. We thank you for the way that we have seen your act through these people and the spread of the gospel and the embrace of your truth. And we pray that you will give us the love and the kindness and the courage to continue to walk in their footsteps. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>